So, so far we have looked at the promise of having faster and faster computers on which to implement cognitive computing. And we've looked at the exquisite detail of the circuitry of the cerebral cortex. But actually, we haven't said a word about cognition. And so my task is to suggest that we have to, as it were, complete the triangle of neural detail, computing power, and cognition, and think a bit about how we open up that conversation to the three uh, different nodes. Now, I actually want to go back to um, about 20 years ago, I was having a conversation with Alan Newell. Here you see Newell and Simon, who were amongst the founders of artificial intelligence with a system they called GPS, the General Problem Solver. And uh, Alan Newell was speculating about how in the future of artificial intelligence you would be able to go up to a lamppost and ask for directions. And what's interesting is we've now reached that. In fact, you don't even need the lamppost. You take out your cell phone, and it has GPS. But unfortunately for Newell, not the general problem solver. <laughs> and using GPS, you can find out where you are and, and get the directions you need. So certain things have happened. And what brought this to mind is that in my spare time, I like to read science fiction. And I was reading, actually for the second time, this book called Ventus. And I think what's interesting is that Werner Vinge talks about it, um, a milestone in science fiction about nanotech and fine-grained distributed systems, uh, which sounds pretty heavy reading, but it's fun. But uh, the hero has access to a worldwide artificial intelligence, which, because he is equipped with some nanotech in his head, allows him to communicate with everything on the planet, even the waves on the lake have their own names which they communicate with him. And he can have simple conversations with different objects to know what they are and what their purpose is and to have them receive instructions as to what they should do for him. And then just to, to complete my week's reading, out comes The Economist with a supplement on when everything connects. And here we talk about the coming wireless revolution where your, your body is telling you that your blood pressure's peaking again, your fridge is reminding you that we need more milk, and uh, your dog is being a pest. But anyway, the, what the theme of this particular issue, which I recommend you to read, because it really gives you a sense of the state of the art and where we might go in the next few years, is the way that we have miniaturization of little knots of sensors, little knots of computation, and the ability to use wireless to interconnect them at many different scales, from the local, very local, to the highly global. On the other hand, this says rather little about the computing intelligence. I think it's Sun that had the um, slogan, the computer is the network. But in fact, today, the computer is not the network. The network is what links together different computers. But if we look at our brains, the computer is the network, and in fact, I would go even further, it is a network of networks. And so I want to think about computation not in terms of the World Wide Web, even augmented by sensor networks and so on, but thinking rather about what are the autonomous agents of the future, whether they're actual machines sharing uh, the physical space with us, or whether they are cognitive machines like web bots going off to search the World Wide Web to bring together the information we need. And back in 88, I came up with three uh, slogans uh, for what I thought the computer of the future, the future of 1988, might look like. And the, the first is cooperative computation. And in some sense, it exhibits what I see as different from the World Wide Web as it is today in the sense that your brain has many different brain regions doing rather different things. Within each region of your brain, there may be many different processes carrying on at the same time. And yet somehow, 
some helping each other, some competing with each other, the whole system converges again and again and again to commit you to an appropriate course of action. So that style of what I call cooperative computation, different representations linked into an integration whole, competition and cooperation or modulation of each other, no one place where knowledge resides and yet the system achieves its ends. So that's the first idea I, I want to put on the table and I think it remains relevant today. The second is what I call perceptual robotics. Today we might call embodied computation. And the idea is that when we talk about those uh, sensor networks, when we talk about the World Wide Web, we tend to think more of information being passed around. Here I want to emphasize that in the end information is for action, whether it's for current action or potential action or future action, it's for action. And so the way in which groups of effectors are united with the sensors and the information processing they need is to me a dominant issue of uh, future computing. And we've seen something of that in the rise of less and less uh, stereotyped robotic behavior, but we're still at the beginning. The third one, learning, has gone from being uh, something just beginning to emerge 20 years ago to a fait accompli. We've gone from uh, neural networks of a very simplified kind, basically abstracting from real neural networks just some simple rules of synaptic plasticity, to very sophisticated forms of machine learning, Bayesian inference, and so on, guiding a bunch of things. But anyway, these three characteristics are what I'd like you to bear in mind. Now, I took this example from a, a, a paper of five years ago, uh, on um, electronics for automobiles uh, to make the point of embodied computation or, or perceptual robots. Here is a, a, a car, um, not even the latest version, with something like 20 or 30 microcomputers on board, uh, a lot of special purpose actuators from the engine to the car seat, uh, a lot of special sensors accordingly. And, and so I'm in some sense offering um, this car to you as one example of what the cognitive computing of the future would look like. What happens as this car becomes uh, more and more an autonomous uh, agent uh, and, and less and less something that you have to take responsibility for. Um, now, before I go on to uh, more about what the brain tells us about cognition and computing, I just want to look at a, a little bit about other forms of biological inspiration that I think might fruitfully enter into our discussion. So I, I rather like this picture that came out recently in Science on the left, uh, showing a Chihuahua and a, a Great Dane, and apparently a gene has been found that allows us to get from one to the other. And yet I think it's a little bit more than changing uh, the size. A lot more has to happen uh, as we go from a creature living like this to a creature uh, living like this. And then moving that into technology, I, I found these two photos on the web. Um, from Western Australia, we have road trains on, on the back roads of Western Australia. The, there are no trains, there are road trains. So have these huge uh, vehicles that can pull, in this case, five different things. And, and uh, it's quite a formidable thing to try to overtake one of these on, on a dirt road. Um, <laughs> And then we have a, a tram or a trolley, depending on your vocabulary. And here is a swatch car, a very small little car. And uh, the point I'm trying to make with this is the body and the brain, as it were, evolve together. So that as we look at different types of embodied systems, then we'll want to see, on the one hand, what general principles of neural architecture, sensory motor, decision making apply, and what is specific. Th this, this picture is, is something of a joke because uh, the body of the tra tram is specialized to run on rails, and this creature is not specialized to run on rails and has got caught on them, and these two are having some difficulties together. Now, here we see a totally different type of body, uh, totally different control problems. Well, not totally different, but very different control problems. What, what are the implications of this? So I just use these simple pictures to, to get you to think about cognition not as a purely abstract information task, but as an embodied challenge. And the other thing I'll mention briefly is that I think most of the emphasis so far has been not even on just uh, mammals, but on the cerebral cortex. Now, there are many parts of the brain besides the, the cerebral cortex, 
and there are many other creatures. And so I just make the point that neuroethology is the study of brain mechanisms that underlie animal behavior. Different animals have markedly different behaviors. And so just to say that there's a lot to learn there for our work besides cognitive neuroscience, which is more human and related creatures. Uh, here's a case of the honeybee flying through a tunnel designed by Srini to, to test how optic flow is used in navigation. Here's the very different and elaborate brain structure of the, the bee, and here's a little robot that navigates on principles inferred from the bee's use of optic flow. So uh, many talks could be given on different specialized creatures and what we can learn from their specialized brains. This is just a placeholder to remind you of that dimension. And the other point, of course, about biology is evolution. And uh, I, I can't say very much about that today, but again, it's a matter of matching structure to function. And that units do not evolve as isolates apart from their interaction with the physical world. And so um, at least your social groupings is going to be interesting. How much is it when you design that uh, autonomous agent, how much is in terms of that autonomous agent monitoring its own sensory data to make its own decisions? To what extent is it part of uh, related creatures? And how much is it part of an even a larger ecosystem? Uh, turning from biology again to the example of the, the earlier slide of different motor vehicles, um, as we get to the stage where more and more we can rely on our cars to have autonomy in terms of deciding when to overtake a car in front and, and sensing what's going on in the other lanes, what sort of social signals and relevant social computing will be required to make that occur safely? But then how would one embed that in a larger system in terms of global positioning satellites, intelligent highways, uh, things that distribute probabilistically the traffic over multiple routes so that there is a, a, an appropriate flow of traffic overall. So again, in terms of the cognitive uh, computing of the future, not only will we add embodied agents to our concern for cognition and computing as disembodied activities, we'll also be thinking about social patterns of our embodied agents and what are the wider designed ecosystems. And let me just finish this little detour with ecosystems themselves. Clearly one of the biggest challenges for intelligent computing in the future is how do we address global warming? How do we address deforestation? How do we address drought by massive instrumentation of the planet and developing the sort of intelligence to be able to exploit those sensors to activate different patterns of, of, of effectors. Okay, so that's the end of the introduction. I see I'm out of time. Thank you. No. The, uh, what I want to do then is to infer a technology from the computing style of the brain. And a lot of the publicity in the past for neural networks has been to abstract just from the brain the fact that there are some basic forms of learning, Hebbian learning, uh, reinforcement learning, supervised learning, and so on. And I, I don't want to downplay that, but I want to, because that is a familiar theme to many of you, I'm going to say relatively little about learning and think more about the fact that not so much let's take a little circuit and let it learn to do a better job, but going the other way around, looking at how different different parts of the brain is, how they interact with each other, what does that tell us about how to design a top-down architecture which can take advantage of the bottom-up circuitry and plasticity? And uh, to, to emphasize this, I've just pulled some, um, another word from our sponsors, um, th this is a, a book that I wrote on neural organization with uh, two Hungarians, Peter Erdi and Janos Syntagatai. Syntagatai is the great uh, neuroanatomist, and so three of these figures uh, by Syntagatai, and this one is by his even greater predecessor, Ramoni Cajal. Um, so we have the cerebellum, we have the spinal cord, the cerebral cortex, and the hippocampus. Now, uh, as we've learned from Dr. Calloway, this this impressive though it is, is a, a very faint approximation of the detailed reality, but that's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is that how very, very different you can see, even at a glance, these architectures are. And so to understand why we would go beyond a, a, a set of uniform circuits to different circuits doing different tasks is, I think, going to be one of the clues. And again, I don't, within the hour I have with you today, I don't have the chance 
to, to begin to penetrate to that level, except I will in a moment look a little bit more about the cerebellum to give you some idea of how special structure may be relevant to, to special function. This picture is just to show you that different cells, um, when stimulated in different parts of the brain, can have very different firing patterns. So again, a whole other chapter that we want to ask if we take inspiration from the brain is why would different cells fire differently? Why does one just come up with an isolated spike or two in response to what's going on? Why does another have a burst? Why are the bursts so different in, in, in shape and frequency? And again, what are the messages we can learn from that? A whole other chapter that I don't have time for today but put on the table as part of what we must understand, not in terms of observing what the brain does, but going further and saying what is the importance of this to a representation of the world that allows computations to occur in a way they might not occur without that particular form of, of firing. Okay, and, and, and just to, to finish that part of the tour, again, we can see that different parts of the brain are quite distinctive. I've shown you pictures, but I want to also say that we seem to get different uh, learning styles in different parts of the brain. We get different morphology. The cells and the way they connect are shaped quite distinctively. Dr. Callaway gave us an excellent understanding of this. And also the gross connections of, of connectivity between different parts of the brain, as illustrated with the excerpt from the COCOMAC database. Um, so there we are. Um, let me skip these details and, and jump straight into this case study of the cerebellum. Uh, the cerebellum is the, the sort of the small brain sitting at the back um, of your, your head underneath the outfolding of the cerebral cortex. Uh, it's involved in many things, but to put it roughly, it's what allows you to move gracefully. So the knowledge of how to move is, is there in cerebral cortex. But if you don't have a cerebellum, your, your movements will be broken up and, and jerky. So somehow that is, is good. Now, the, the cerebellum involves some nuclei, some cell groupings, um, and then above those cell groupings there is the cortex. Uh, now the cerebellar cortex, not the cerebral cortex. So uh, I'll just make two remarks then. Here's a little fragment to give you some idea of the geometry of the cellular arrangements in the cerebellar cortex. Uh, the only kind of cell that has an output is called a Purkinje cell. It's named in honor of a, a, a Czech gentleman named uh, Purkinje. And uh, there is a Purkinje square in Prague with a statue of Jan Purkinje. So next time you're in Prague uh, and you feel inspired about the brain, go and pay homage. But this is a, an amazing neuron because it has the order of 200,000 inputs coming in in parallel. So there are these things called granule cells which receive these inputs called mossy fibers. Each granule cell goes up, its axon bifurcates in a T, and perhaps 200,000 of those parallel fibers, the T bars from the granule cells, pass through here. Um, so the, the current architecture that I think in terms of is you've got motor pattern generators in other parts of the brain, things that can control your eye movements, control your limb movements, and so on. Uh, and the cerebellar nuclei uh, can modulate. Their firing can increase or decrease the patterns of activity in these motor pattern generators. And now what we, we know is that the cerebellar cortex, the only way it talks to the world is by inhibiting the cerebellar nucleus. So the dogma is the cerebellar cortex is, is learning how to best provide inhibitory sculpting so that this modulation from the cerebellar nucleus gets the motor pattern generators to work well and work well together. And so we have an area of the brain called, um, well, many different area, areas of the brain contribute the mossy fibers that go through the granule cells to then provide this input and then uh, another part of the brain called the inferior olive tends to, to, to have um, the, the input. And if, if, if you'll pardon uh, those of you who have heard me talk recently, uh, my repeating the following, uh, I am, uh, as only a few of you yet know, the James Bond of, of neuroscience, um, because my membership number in the Society for Neuroscience is 007. And uh, so in, in terms of what I was just telling you, my slogan as the James Bond of neuroscience is I will not accept an inferior olive. 
in my martini. Thank you, thank you. This is all I can ask for. Is your... All right. So abstracting from this, inspired in part by Masao Ito, we, we think of this as the, the basic architecture of the cerebellum that we have. Uh, of course, in each case here, one or a few cells are standing in for large populations. But the key idea is that we've got a nuclear cell that's talking to the rest of the world. The nuclear cell has some input to the inferior olive, as do other places. The inferior olive has what is called a climbing fiber that provides massive input. So a, a single Purkinje cell receives a multi-branched input from only one inferior olive cell, the climbing fiber. So when the climbing fiber says jump, the Purkinje cell jumps. In fact, it jumps several times. The mossy fibers both talk to the nucleus, but then via the granule cells, they're scattered, as it were, into small nonlinear combinations, which then provide this massive hundreds of thousands of inputs to, to the Purkinje cells. And the idea that David Marr and Jim Albus came up with around 1969-70 was that it's the active climbing fiber to the Purkinje cell provides the training signal for the synapses from the parallel fibers to the Purkinje cell. And uh, David Ma thought that it was like a perceptron, a strengthening of the synapse. Uh, Jim Albus thought it was a weakening of the synapse. And then uh, about 12 years later, Masao Ito in Japan came along and showed that, in fact, it was a weakening of the synapse, long-term depression. Now, to my disappointment, Masao Ito, instead of continuing at this level of doing neurophysiology, got intrigued with the neurochemistry of long-term depression. And a few years ago, this is what he came up with. And this is one synapse, people. Now, I mean, this is where you make a career decision, right? Um, is cognitive computing going to be based on looking at all the details, or is some level of abstraction going to be involved? Uh, my, my, uh, I was at a, a conference 40-odd years ago, um, which was the first introduction, really, of molecular biology in, into neuroscience, introduced by, by Frank Schmidt. And so I gave the, the talk at the closing dinner, where I, I said that, well, it was all very well now to get into these molecular details, but I really felt it was premature to, to, to reflect those back into neuroscience until we understood elementary particle physics more fully. So. Uh, the point I'm making here is not to put down these details, but ask what is going to be our strategy in the future, whether we're pure computational neuroscientists just trying to understand the brain, or whether we're technologists trying to say what lessons do we get from the brain, what do we do when faced with something like that? What I would say is that we start with models that use evidence to link certain salient aspects of this to behavior or cognition. And then we bring in more details as we understand. Now, let me give you just one example of how um, Nicolas Schweighoffer and I were, were forced, as it were, to get a little neurochemical without beginning to approach this level of detail. But um, what we were looking at was the following fact. We, we were looking at how you get more skillful at a movement. So now the Purkinje cell fires sometime later that goes to the nucleus and that goes to the motor pattern generator, the muscles contract, the action takes place, visual feedback, let's say you're throwing a ball at a target, comes back, so maybe 200 milliseconds later, the climbing fiber sends its error signal to the cell. Now if that climbing fiber were combined with the current activity of the, the synapses, it would be meaningless. So we have to come up with this idea of eligibility where basically each synapse has its own little working memory saying, um, did I or did I not fire 200 milliseconds ago? And if I fired 200 milliseconds ago, I need to respond to the current training signal. But if I wasn't involved 200 milliseconds ago, then this error signal doesn't apply to me, so I shouldn't change. And that led us to a very simple chemical model, so just a, a fraction of, of what we see here. But I think this sort of dialogue then would be what gets to be exciting. Somebody comes up with new details, and then some of them will just remain on the back burner for now, or they may be very useful for drug design. Others, I hope, modelers can grab and say, OK, my, my learning rule didn't work all that well. What extra details can I get from this new neurochemistry? How can I make a system that learns more efficiently, as in my 200 millisecond delay example? So to finish, these, the idea then is that this cerebellar microcomplex, the local circuitry, can take the parallel fiber information to better tune a particular motor pattern generator, but the overlap 
uh, because the parallel fibers are long, some parallel fibers will be shared between uh, different microcomplexes. That can allow also synaptic plasticity to better coordinate the two. And so we get the function of the cerebellum. Uh, of course, this isn't the full story, but enough to give you some sense of, of the following points. There was a special type of learning. This wasn't Hebbian learning, it wasn't reinforcement learning. It was a type of supervised learning with a, a, a special type of eligibility trace. Um, the individual neurons are very special. We at least got a sense of the, the special structure of the uh, granule cell with its axon going up and forming a T to give us the parallel fibers. We saw that amazing geometry of my favorite neuron, the, the Purkinje cell. And then finally, I, I was at some pains to show you how it wasn't just looking at the cerebellar cortex in isolation. We looked at how it uh, shared inputs um, with the, the nuclei beneath it um, how it only interacted with the nuclei through inhibition and how that integrated cerebellar system could talk to different motor pattern generators to better modulate them. And so this is the, the point that I think about, um, about how one can approach different systems. And uh, I think this is my last ad, um, the Handbook of Brain Theory and Neural Networks, second edition. There are about 286 authors were kind enough to write articles for me um, and thus for you about both brain theory with the emphasis on the biology and brain theory in terms of artificial neural networks. And I think this remains um, an excellent source for going into the realization of how many specific uh, models and data there are for us to integrate, no matter how many uh, or how few uh, unifying principles we come up with. Okay. Briefly, let me return to this idea of cooperative computation. If you remember, I said that there were three principles I saw defining future computing. The, the embodied robotics or embodied computation, perceptual robotics as one of them, learning uh, as another, and the, the, the first I mentioned was cooperative computation. The idea that rather than having a serial uh, computation um, through which the, the, the processing proceeds through a central processing unit, we would have many different um, modules, if we're talking structurally, schemas, if we're talking functionally, that would be sampling their own particular part of the information and trying to make sense of it themselves, but the sense they made of it would depend on knowing what their neighbors were saying. Thus, in some case, one would tell a neighbor, you're wrong, you're wrong, I've got a very confident estimate, you pipe down. In other cases, they would be saying, oh, we seem to be agreeing, let's get together and together we can form a coherent analysis. And uh, so this is the architecture of the visions, all in capital system, of my colleagues uh, Hansen and Reisman uh, from the mid-70s, 30 years ago. So I think that some of the very vital ingredients for our cognitive architectures have been around for a very long time, but perhaps lacked the uh, computing power um, to, to, to go forward as far as they might have. But uh, let me just interject a, a political note, too. They also lacked the funding will. Uh, because what happened to Hansen Reisman, I visited them about a year and a half ago, and we were talking about this wonderful system of theirs from the 70s. And I was trying to say, what's, what's hap what have you done with it? Where are we going? They said, we couldn't get any funding. Mm. Their field was computer vision, and the funding they got was solve this computer vision problem, solve that computer vision problem. Getting funding for a wonderful architecture within which to situate better these different studies was not available. So part of our, our problem in making cognitive computation happen is can we avoid that trap of being told, well, of course you can have money for cognitive computation um, if you will come up with a, a, a better system for adjusting powertrains on, on, on diesel engines. Um, there has to be that, that far ahead funding for I, 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 this is special pleading, I should tell you, for, uh, for look, taking the long view and being able to develop these general concepts. Yes, in conversation with applications, because that will provide richness, but not applications only, because that won't let us get far enough. Um, so here the idea was that you're looking at an image, uh, and, and you can pull out things like uh, segments and lines, features, and so on, and you build up an intermediate database of candidate regions. Here's an area that is delimited from another area. Here is an area with common color or depth or texture. And on that basis, you can now bring schemas 
uh, from long-term memory. What does it take to recognize a house? What does it take to recognize a tree? What does it take to recognize a person? And you can instantiate them to apply to different parts of the image. And in this way, you try to make sense of the world. So at any time, we have long-term memory, schemas in relation, knowledge of the world, driving, in response to the bottom-up information, the uh, instantiation of schema instances that will link into to that world. So uh, c c compressing a whole lecture to a single slide, here's the idea. Here's a, a typical uh, house scene. Here is an initial segmentation. Here's the final analysis of a system 30 years ago. What's interesting, to just make one point with you, is that notice the initial segmentation missed this edge. And the trouble is that if you look at the act, if we go back and look at that missing edge, we see it's very low contrast. So the problem is that if you went through with a low threshold on contrast, you would have so many spurious edges in here, you would never have anything big enough to provide an island of reliability for further analysis. So this idea of rather than just going bottom up all the way, you go bottom up until you have some islands of reliability, like recognizing a big blue region at the top as sky, then anchors recognizing the region of this shape just below it as roof, which then allows you to recognize the region just below it as wall, but uh-oh, I'm in trouble because that edge is missing, and then that drives the analysis to say, is there some way I can break up that region where at the top I'm pretty confident it's sky, at the bottom I'm pretty confident it's wall. And so the process continues through this process of bottom-up, top-down, um, dynamic interaction, cooperative computation. And then, uh, just in one slide, one can then imagine uh, embedding that type of architecture into an ongoing process where rather than just having perceptual schemas interpreting the image, we have motor schemas which are hypotheses about what action to carry out next. And so at any stage, we'll have many uh, motor schemas receiving parameters from the perceptual schemas. If you do do it, do, do a grasp, then you're going to do it to an object over there of that shape. If you're going to locomote, you're not going to go this way, there's an obstacle in front of you, you're going to go this way. And these compete and cooperate again. So at each moment, there will be certain potential actions, then one or more of these will be activated, and then you will have to refresh your representation of your relation to the world to take account of what you've done and what you still intend to do. And so the same process of cooperative computation um, can, can continue. So in that sense, I think cooperative computation is one of those grand unifying principles of cognition, but the devil is in the details. I'm, I'm going to now uh, give two examples of systems that I've been interested in, and, and these will be breathless uh, presentations of just the high-level architecture to try and get some ideas in place for our ongoing discussion uh, today and tomorrow, rather than to tell you everything about it. But I'm, I'm going to talk about mirror neurons and the idea that a particular architecture that evolved for visual control of grasping has, according to a hypothesis I've developed with Giacomo Rizzolatti, become um, the architecture that supports human language. So uh, let's start here. This is a, a macaque a brain. And um, for orientation, this is the back of the brain, visual cortex, the front of the brain. In the parietal lobe, uh, there is a groove. Um, the intraparietal sulcus, and so if we open it up, the AIP is just the anterior, the front region that's distinguishable in the IP, the intraparietal sulcus, and Hideo Sakata of Nihon University in Tokyo found that if he visually recorded from this region while um, a monkey was looking at an object, the firing of neurons would be specific not for the type of the object, but for the way the object was grasped. This is in distinction to the classic studies where if you come down here into infratemporal cortex, then you seem to get more of the characterization of what the object is. So here, you might say, well, if I see a cube, the firing's going to be different from seeing a sphere. Whereas here, if the cube and the sphere are of such a size, you're going to grab them the same way, uh, then you're going to have the same coding. And then F5 in the, the, the numbering system for frontal cortex developed in, in Parma in Italy, Giacomo Rizzolatti and his colleagues found neurons that seem to code for grasp. So things like um, a precision pinch would be the correlatum of one set of cells, whereas a power grasp would be a correlatum of other set of cells. Further, it doesn't seem that this is an in, in 
an innate repertoire, but rather one that develops through experience. So if the monkey has had the benefit of cracking peanuts, you'll find cells that fire in relation to peanut cracking. Uh, tearing pieces of paper, there'll be cells that fire in relation to that. So here was the state of play, and um, I mentioned the distinction between the firing for what the object is versus firing for the motor parameters associated with the object, and this has a history that goes back to uh, Mishkin and Ungerleider in the monkey, but in the humans has been explored in a couple of interesting lesion studies. So here's the visual cortex, here's the path down to infratemporal cortex, here's the path up to parietal cortex, and on to the control of the reach and the grasp. And what um, Goodale and Milner uh, found was a poor woman who, who had been taking a shower um, when the, the guys are heating the water um, had developed carbon monoxide leak and so she lost this part of her brain and what was intriguing was the following that if you would uh, show her let's say an object like a cylinder um, and but of course the cylinder could be of any different graspable size and asked her uh, how big the object was she could not tell you and if you asked her to pantomime the size of the object, well, show me how big it is, there was still no correlation between her hand shape and the width of the object. But if you asked her to reach for the object, there was a perfect linear correlation between her, the aperture of her hand halfway towards the target and the size of the target. So in other words, that, that information about uh, cylinder diameter was represented here for the task the how to do the task, but wasn't represented either to, to speech or pantomime for describing what the size of the object was. So that distinction between the what pathway and the how pathway was established. And then um, a group in, in Lyon, uh, led by Marc Genero, had a patient with the, the opposite lesion, and this person could tell you uh, what the object was, but couldn't pre-shape her hand. She would just go out with the maximal hand shape and then use tactile feedback to shape the hand uh, when she got to it. And there's some other interesting things about this story, but, but that's enough for now. Uh, and, and such considerations led Andrew Fagg and myself to develop this model with the idea that you start with this object, and if you're going in this pathway, the idea is the object's uninterpreted. This is the how pathway, it's not the what pathway. So you don't know what it is. But you can recognize, oh, I could grab it here, I could grab it here, I could grab it here. And then somehow these alternatives get to F5, which must command the motor system which of the possible grasps to take. But if we go this way through the infratemporal thing, we recognize it's a mug, and then prefrontal cortex can grab that in terms of task constraints, working memory. Um, yes, I know it's a mug, but it's just in the way I need to move it out of the way to grab some papers, then it might bias in terms of this affordance, just pick up the mug by the rim and move it. Whereas if I remember there's still some coffee left and I'm still uh, decaffeinated, so to speak, um, then bias it to, to exploit this affordance. So that was the sort of study. Now, around 95, um, when we were already collaborating with Rizzolatti, his group, this is just what the full model looks like, his group came up with the discovery of mirror neurons. So down here we see the sort of data that guided our initial work, the idea that there are neurons such that when the monkey uh, carries out a specific reach, then this neuron will fire vigorously. So we're seeing here the firing on 10 different occasions and the histogram across this. But the mirror neurons were an anatomically segregated subset such that they would fire almost as vigorously as shown by this histogram, when observing someone else apply the precision pinch as distinct from the power grasp. So this mirror neuron is active for both execution and observation of a precision pinch. And there's been a huge literature developed on that. Um, my feeling is that they probably evolved in the first place just to support manual dexterity, to be able to observe the relation between hand and object. But once the brain had that representation of relation between hand and object, it could then support the recognition of others' hands in relation to object, even though the retinal display was so different. And then that, in turn, could provide both a basis for skill and a basis for social interaction. And so the cycle of evolutionary spiraling uh, continued from there. Uh, we have models of it. I won't take time to, to run you through that. Um, what I do want to tell you is that our immediate reaction at USC 
to the monkey work in, in Parma was to say, are there regions of the human brain that light up? We couldn't do a cell by cell. Here is the cell that codes the precision pinch, but we could say, is there a place in the brain that lights up both when uh, the human is doing hand actions and when the human is seeing somebody else do hand actions? And the answer was that yes, and the one in frontal cortex turned out to be Broca's area, which is traditionally thought of as a speech production area. So you said, what is a mirror system for grasping doing in a speech production area? But then your deaf friends start signing to you and they point out to you that, no, it's not speech, it's language, and language is not vocal. Language is multimodal. Vocal is just one way of, of having language. And so that led us to a paper called Language Within Our Grasp, uh, in which we tried to elaborate this idea. And again, let me just show one picture to indicate a sort of cognitive architecture that grows out of these considerations. And, and this is still not very well articulated, and part of our current research is to fill in more and more of this. But the idea is this, that we start then with a mirror system for action, and, and through a number of stages that we've charted in several papers, but I won't have time for today, um, we evolve a system that is a mirror system for words, but by words I mean words as actions, the phonological object. So if I say word, okay, that means something, hopefully, but we're saying this part of the brain just knows that there's a certain motor routine for producing that, that motor routine produces a particular sound, and so it can recognize that sound when it hears it and produce that sound. So the, the suggestion is there's no direct path from uh, part of your brain saying, I'm going to carry out a particular action, and part of your brain saying, uh, I'm going to generate or I'm hearing the word for that action. This is simply an evolutionary relationship. And down here is the sort of thing I hinted at when I presented the visions system of cooperative computation to you. There's a whole system that can look at the world and come up with a network of schemas or schema instances that represent what is in the world, their relations to each other, and determine an appropriate course of action. And so the idea is that this relatively symbolic perceptual motor structure is what then instructs the activity in the dorsal pathway to actually carry out the action with all the motor parameters in place. So as I, I said with the what and where or the how and uh, what slide, we're distinguishing between actions as something you can talk about uh, or pantomime from actions as something you carry out with motor precision uh, in the world. So there's that pathway and then conversely the idea is that as you recognize an action using your mirror system that doesn't directly trigger the word but comes down here to your evolving schema network and then it's the interaction here that links your plans about the world with your ability to, to talk about the world and, of course, eventually talk about it a lot more. Okay. So my last uh, example is going to be spatial navigation. And, uh, again, the theme is going to be an evolutionary theme. The idea that the brain uh, is a house of many mansions, um, looking for a single unifying principle may not help you, but looking for an evolutionary basis may, saying here's a certain repertoire of tasks. We can understand how the brain could have evolved to carry out that basic repertoire, and then maybe we can approach the greater complexity of the brain as we understand how that repertoire expands along with something of the amount of brain tissue and the subtlety of the brain tissue and the patterns of connections that mediate. So I'm going to give you one more example of this. So back in, um, so let me just define the idea of cognitive map. Um, little rats running mazes, uh, for a long time, psychology was dominated by behaviorism, so that everything was to be done by stimulus response chaining. So on that account, how did a rat learn to run through a maze? Because at each point, the stimulus of seeing that part of the maze would elicit the response of turning to the left or right appropriately to get to the goal box. But then Toulmin looked at experiments where you would block off part of the maze, and without any problem, the rat would just divert, detour, and find another way to get to its goal. So the idea was that it had a cognitive map, not a chain, but it had that information about the disposition of its world so that if one course of action was blocked, its brain was able to find an appropriate alternative course of action. Now, in the mid-70s, John O'Keefe in London 
discovered that in the hippocampus of the rat there were cells whose firing correlated better than anything else with where the rat was in the little maze or whatever uh, where its behavior was being studied. So these became called place cells. And so this led O'Keefe and his colleague Nadell to publish a book called The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map. And they then distinguished the idea of map-based navigation, um, which they thought the hippocampus mediated, from just taxon uh, systems. So many of you know the word uh, taxon, uh, not by itself, but in a word like uh, phototaxis where there's some stimulus and you turn towards the stimulus, the, the, the plant turning towards the light. So uh, to take an example, you, you are in a strange city and you're looking for a restaurant. Well, the map-based system is, is you go to your concierge at the hotel and you get a little map and although you, it may be many, many blocks away, you're able to follow the map to find your way to the restaurant. The other is just to wander and then you see a sign with the word restaurant in some language you recognize, and then you just orient towards that to get to the restaurant without having a map of the city at all. Okay, so that's the distinction. Now, uh, there's an old New Yorker cartoon that seems to be relevant to blowing out of the water the idea of the hippocampus as a cognitive map. Uh, this poor guy is in the desert. He's dying of thirst and hunger, and then he sees a billboard, and he laboriously crawls towards it, and it's a map. It bears the letter X and the slogan, you are here. And the problem is, that's what the hippocampus is, right? It says you are here, but if you want to get somewhere else, it doesn't help you at all. So the issue is, I believe that the cognitive map has a crucial role for the hippocampus, namely as the, this is where you are, but it takes cooperation with other parts of the brain to represent the goal and then read out from those two things an appropriate path, an appropriate course of action. Uh, to achieve things. But anyway, we, we then wanted to model separately this affordance-based or taxon-based system and then how the, 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 the cognitive map could come in. So just as in the case of the hand movements where we had uh, the, the parietal cortex looking at the shape of the object so the premotor cortex could select uh, which particular grasp to use on the object. So we can imagine the rat in its little world looking at different alleyways and deciding which alley to go down. And um, we then brought in learning by saying, okay, when the rat acts, uh, there are going to be consequences. Maybe it gets some food, maybe it gets an electric shock. And so we need a whole system in the brain that can apply what we now call reinforcement learning to change the evaluation of the affordances to find the one which is most likely to yield a reward. And, and to just cut a long story short, here is our rat um, looking at this T maze. And it doesn't know where it is in the world, but it's, it's been trained that when it gets to a T, um, it will get food if it turns to the left. So its brain, to oversimplify, has this representation of affordances. You can turn left 180 or 90, you can turn right 180 or 90. But if you, um, in terms of expected reinforcement, the only place you can expect to get reinforcement is going to be by turning left 90. So by combining uh, this information, you direct a turn uh, in that direction. Now, Israel Lieblich and I, um, Actually, we actually started our work before the hippocampus as a cognitive map came out. Um, but we were trying to, to actually go directly back to Tulman and figure out what would be a computational representation. And we came up with the idea of the world graph, graph in the sense of nodes and edges, where each node would say, here's a recognizable place or situation in the animal's world. Each edge is a path from one known place uh, to another. And... Um, Again, let's, let's not get into the details, but we put together then what the rat knows at any particular time is that it knows how hungry, how thirsty, how horny it is. Um, it knows its current map of the world, and it knows where it thinks it is. Because in fact, you can do experiments where you can see the rat, after running around in the dark, will think it's in one place in the maze, um, but you, in terms of recording from the place cells, but if you look at what it does next, it's clear it thinks it it, it's clear it thinks where the place cells are firing, not where it actually is. So this idea, this represents the state, and then we represented how, on the basis of the current drive state, uh, suggested position, apparent position of world graph, 
the system could choose actions and then on that basis update its world graph and, and so on. And then uh, posing that into the brain, we then have the system I've talked about before. Uh, we have the hippocampus. The hippocampus is... I, I did have a little dot somewhere. But... All right, the... See? It's like the rat. I had a, an obstacle and I went around the detour and used the mouse. That's fine. And used the mouse instead. So it's rather nice to have a mouse to demonstrate how the rat works. Um, a very intelligent mouse. All right. So, so here we have the hippocampal map and then we postulate that the prefrontal uh, system holds the world graph and then we spelt out in some computational detail how, as the rat moved, it would update its estimate of where it was in relation to visual cues as to where it was, and how the, the sort of unbiased selection of affordances would interact with the world graph. And so we see these evolutionary levels as we move up from just reactive behavior to reinforcement learning to, to make that reactive behavior depend on prior experience to bringing in the cognitive map so that sophisticated knowledge about where you are in the world uh, can, can take you beyond the mere exploitation of, of the affordances. So just, just to give you one example of a, how to take some insights from studying an animal and think uh, about cognitive computing uh, as a technology, I, I looked at the following. Imagining, uh, in the first place, the system we've just seen, we've got a brain or a body with its and together in one place, they're looking at the world outside, and then with the sort of system I've just described, the sensors are going to give you the information you need about where you are in the world, you've got your own internal state, and then you're going to move your eyes to get more information and deploy locomotion to get towards your goal. So imagine instead that the creature that we're studying is a highway. And now the brain, instead of being inside the world, the world is inside the body, right? The, the highway has its brain with its sensors, its actuators, and so on. The body is fixed, it's circumglobal. Sensors may move, transient uh, coalitions can take place, sensor fusion becomes crucial, and then on that basis, instructions can be given to the individual cars so that they will move more effectively so that rather than the brain being inside the autonomous agent, uh, the brain is in this circumglobal world in which other aut autonomous agents can be organized. So um, I think I've said everything that's in there. So I want to close just by, by looking at a little bit of a dilemma. I've, I think I've made the point to you that um, we can learn a lot from the brain, um, both of intrigue in understanding ourselves and other creatures, but also that can be used for the world. Now, for technology, though, we would like to have something else. The, the problem, I mean, if you, if you regard a PhD as uh, the proof that your neural network has been fully trained, um, that's, that's a long process. And I don't want to go to the store and buy an autonomous system and get it out of the box and be told that if I train it carefully for the next 25 years, it will actually be useful for me. So what I need, right, is, is that that training can be transferred. So we want to be able to download, as it were, the synaptic matrix and put it in a new system. And it, Now, the catch is this for me, is that part of what I've been showing you is that to understand the brain, we can't just... Uh, think of the brain as one big network. There are different sub-networks with very exquisitely different architectures learning different things. The catch is that suppose I trained the locomotion part of the cerebellum to be very good, um, but I now want to put it in a robot that hasn't had the same training. Unfortunately, its motor cortex will have adapted to interact with an old-fashioned cerebellum not the new model cerebellum. So this is a place where I think the computer science of the future for cognitive brain-inspired architecture is going to face some real challenges. You can't let learning spread willy-nilly the way it does in a real brain 
where each part of the brain adapts to work with other parts of the brain, if indeed you want to have modules you can pull out and reuse in different applications. So I just point, so I, I, I call this um, augmenting neural computing with a, a reflection technology. You not only, uh, as it were, develop through experience a better module of a particular kind, but you also develop through experience updated specs for that, so you know when you can use that module in interaction with other modules. So my last slide, um, this has been a very small sample of, of, of what I could talk about, and what I can talk about is a very small sample of what we already know about uh, neuroscience in general and cognitive neuroscience in particular. But I hope it's giving you some sense of the diversity of strategies for sensor computation effector integration. And so giving you some sense of what that part of cognitive computing will look like that focuses not on information and cognition in the abstract, but really thinks about embodied agents that interact within complex ecosystems. Thank you. was her sensory cognition of spatial determination. Is that consistent, or is that unique just with her? I'm kind of curious about that particular um, situation. Well, the claim is that there is a dedicated pathway of visual information related to control of the hands. Yes. And, and so, in this case, she had lost that part that was involved in, as it were, the cognitive system going through the temporal lobe. I so guess was, the, the point is, it's a localized lesion. So the brain, if we think of the brain as a network of sophisticated subsystems, okay. then you can indeed get damage either because you pull out two or three subsystems or you disconnect subsystems. But it might vary from person to person, just depending on which section was first affected by the carbon monoxide. Is that kind of what you're suggesting? Or, well, or I, I gave you two patients. So one had the, the lesion up here. Yes. Um, and could no longer pre-shape her hand appropriately. The okay. other had the lesion down here and could pre-shape her hand but could no longer describe for you what the size of the object was. Okay, thanks. So, so I have a question, Professor Arby. There's a question there. Please introduce yourself first. Hi, my name is Paul Alapena, and I'm uh, with a small company, Aptima, and Brown University, working with Jim Anderson. And uh, I guess my question is uh, about your last point, about the reflective technology. And that is, uh, um, well, I guess it's a two-part question. The first part is why you wouldn't want to open the box and wait 25 years. Uh, there's, no, there's a presumption there that all training would have to be in real time in computer architectures. And that's not necessarily true, is it? Well, if we, if we take, for example, a, a technology where we have some experience with this, which is speech recognition technology, uh, what you'll find is that the system has been trained to the point where it's fairly useful if you have a fairly normal accent, and then it will adjust to your idiosyncrasies over an amount of time that doesn't drive you completely up the wall. But it has to, to be good enough that you're already getting use out of it immediately, and the downtime for your involvement in training is, is therefore acceptable. Now, in certain real-time applications, you can't even, if, if you take that car out on the highway, it had better be right, right from the beginning. You can't say, well, I needed to crash three times till I could adjust my, my spacing from the car in front. So, so it's, it's going to be a question. You know, how much can you do that's reusable, and how much do you really have to start over again in the factory for a particular product, train it up in the factory, and then every model of, of, of that Every, sorry, every instance of that model accepts that same preliminary training versus where you can actually say, well, here's a subsystem that I want to use in 100 different products, and I can take that subsystem and I can reuse it again and again, because although I no longer know the fine details of its synaptic connectivity that allow it to do its magic, I've been able to keep my specs up to date, so I'm confident that within 99.999%, it will do uh, the job it has to do. Right. Okay. This lady down here. Uh, Kenita Watson um, with GoCryo. The um, talk about 
opening the box and waiting 25 years, it doesn't necessarily have to be 25 real years, right? You can do it in a virtual space where you're simulating doing uh, things in the real world only in you know, 10x or 100x real time. Well, probably not. Um, the reason I say that is that I think that uh, what we're talking, let's just take an example. Dan Hammerstrom is an expert on VLSI for neural networks. One of the problems with VLSI is that although you can now put a billion transistors on a chip, the pinout and the pin in is still very limited. So if you want to connect the, the neuron simulator one chip to another, the best solution is time sharing so that you, you use those wires not to be the dedicated wires that, for a single neuron, but time sharing them between a thousand. So that in the end, to get up to what would correspond to real time in the brain, you're still using that gigaflop uh, capability of the chip compared to the, to the, to the one mega, sorry, millihertz uh, of what we're doing. So I don't think that um, in, in those cases, if you really want to respond to the fine details of the environment, I think the clock rates are going to be about the same for, for the, that system as for yours. Well, the, um, you can, it seems that you would be able, for the sake of learning, to abstract away a lot of the details. I mean, depending on what you're trying to, um, to simulate, right? If you're trying to keep cars from crashing into each other, you don't need to do it down to the micrometer. No, but it may well be that... that you may have to have experience with quite a few cars to be able to compensate for different lighting conditions, different makes of car, and, and things of this kind. So that therefore, it might be, yes, by, as we know, training from examples, by judicious choice of the training, you can certainly cut down the learning time rather than just allowing an average sample. But I still think we're talking about a draining amount of time. So even if, if I tell you, okay, Congratulations, our new improved model. You're only going to have to train it for a year instead of 25 years. You're, you're not going to be happy. So, so that's my concern there. Okay. That's all we have time for. Let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you.